In the shadows of history, where myth and truth intertwine, lies a tale that has shaped civilizations and kindled the faith of billions. Welcome to Myth Vision's groundbreaking documentary, where we embark on an intellectual odyssey to unravel one of the Bible's most enduring legends, the Exodus. Prepare to have your understanding challenged and your beliefs tested as we delve deep into the sands of time with the guidance of renowned Assyriologist Joshua Bowen, drawing from his provocative book, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament. We navigate through whispers of the past, assertions of the present, and scholarly evidence that might just change the narrative of history as you know it. This journey is not just another story. It's a quest for truth, a revelation that will shock many who have never dared to question. As we venture into this uncharted territory, we invite you to engage, to become part of this historic exploration. Like this video, subscribe to Myth Vision, and dive into the comment section to join the discussion. Your voice matters in this journey of discovery. And for those intrigued by the depths we're about to explore, a link to purchase Joshua Bowen's enlightening book, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, is waiting for you in the description below. Embark on your own journey of understanding and insight. Are you ready to explore the unseen and the untold? Join us as we uncover whether the Exodus is a historical event or a mythological saga engraved in the annals of time. Your journey into the past begins now. Exodus from Ignorance. This was Dr. Joshua Bowen's experience. My father and I are a lot alike. When things start going well, we have a tendency to break out into song. I grew up working with my dad in his construction company, and while he was usually quite stern and a little irritable, there were times that things would all fall into place, and you would hear him bellow often while swinging a hammer. Oh, my Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I got to do is follow. Now, he didn't know the rest of the song, but that was of little consequence. The message for him contained in these few words sounded through loud and clear. God was in control of his situation. Although the job he was working had seen its ups and downs, it was all in the hands of his Lord. If he would but trust and follow him, God would bring him through any adversity. For my father, the words of this hymn and the story of deliverance that stood behind it allowed him to identify with the children of Israel who traveled through the wilderness on their way out of Egypt, guided by the mighty outstretched arm of Yahweh. God cared for his people then, and he would care for my father now. The question of the historicity of the Exodus story was not terribly significant to him. While he certainly would have affirmed that what the Bible said was true, that God led the children of Israel out of Egypt after inflicting ten horrible plagues on the Pharaoh and his people. The historical veracity of the story wasn't really something that concerned him. It was the story itself that mattered. Remembering what God had done and would still do, though perhaps on a smaller scale, was what brought him comfort and gave him the confidence to meet the challenges in his life. It also brought him into closer relationship with like-minded believers in his church and community. From the inception of the religion, Christians have continued to see themselves as God's chosen people. This shared tradition of Yahweh's deliverance solidifies their collective identity and brings a large measure of cohesion and purpose to both the group and individuals. But why am I bringing all of this up? Why talk about how the story of the Exodus was and still is used by people like my father in the course of their day-to-day -day lives? Because this is nothing new. However, one interprets the historical and archaeological data concerning the Exodus event. Perhaps what matters most is how people have used the story throughout the millennia. The point of the story was to demonstrate Yahweh's unrivaled power, not only over the Pharaoh and his army, but also over the elements. In other words, the message of the story of Moses is, God can use weak, unskilled, hesitant, and even cowardly people to accomplish his will, and nothing can stand in his way. This message, sung about in hymns, read about in children's books, 
and preached from the pulpit, functions as a source of solace, encouragement, and strength for the individual and the community in Christian and Jewish circles. Because of this, in a very real sense, the historicity of the exodus and the wanderings through the wilderness need not be as significant as many might think. Perhaps the more fundamentalist believer should now ask themselves, what if the Exodus never took place? What if the story, as narrated in the Hebrew Bible, has only a kernel of historical validity that stands behind it? What if there was not one Exodus from Egypt as described in the Old Testament, but many Exoduses, much smaller and less dramatic, that took place over hundreds of years? What would this do to my faith? While many may conclude that their faith would be shattered if these things turned out to be true, a more common and enduring approach by the church and within Judaism has been to find ways of adapting their faith to incorporate different understandings of the stories in the Hebrew Bible. Of course, it is not my purpose here, or anywhere for that matter, to persuade someone to leave their faith. Instead, I open the documentary in this way to encourage the viewer, be they an atheist, skeptic, or believer, to consider how the following information about the exodus from Egypt could or should affect their interpretation and application of the story, along with the rest of the Hebrew Bible. For those of my readers who are believers, this chapter may prompt you to decide that the evidence indeed suggests that the exodus, as described in the Old Testament, is not historically reliable. This illumination potentially threatens to jeopardize your faith. If it does, I would like to suggest that you need not leave your religious tradition on these grounds alone. Although this would be a perfectly reasonable response, quite similar to my own experience, there are sincere and committed believers who maintain their faith in the God of the Hebrew Bible, in whatever form that takes for them. In spite of the historically inaccurate presentation of events in the text, including, and perhaps most importantly, the Exodus from Egypt. We begin then with the all important question of this chapter. Is the Exodus story as presented in the Hebrew Bible historically reliable? As we suggested before, there is little doubt that the historicity of the Exodus continues to be a topic of tremendous interest and hot debate. For example, a 2013 symposium held in San Diego, California, brought together top researchers from the fields of biblical studies, archaeology, Egyptology, and even computer and geoscience to examine the evidence for the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt from a wide range of perspectives. No shortage of books and articles have been published by specialist and non-specialist alike in an attempt to unravel the mystery of the biblical account of Israel's departure from captivity. What happened? Who was involved? When did the event or events take place? How does the evidence compare with the biblical record? In what follows, we will wade into the sea of evidence and arguments that have come from scholars in the fields of primarily biblical studies, archaeology, and Egyptology. And, as you might expect, we will attempt to tease out the interpretations on which nearly all scholars agree, while identifying those that are more nuanced and still debated. First, we will briefly review the biblical story of the Exodus from Egypt. If you recall from Dr. Joshua Bowen's Volume 1 of the Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, he covered the narrative of the Pentateuch, including the story of the Exodus. We will present the Exodus narrative again here in a bit more detail in order to set the reader's focus on how closely the story informed the first generations of biblical scholars as they wrestled with the historical and archaeological data, all the while searching for the truth. We will then turn to the earliest written evidence that we have for Israel and or the Exodus. This will begin with the first mention of Israel in the textual record, the Merneptah Stele. We will then examine some of the biblical prophets from as early as the 8th century who relay traditions of the Exodus from Egypt. We will consider several of these passages in their contexts in order to determine what the prophets had in mind 
when speaking of the Exodus and how this can help us determine whether there were different traditions concerning Israel and their interactions with Egypt. Staying with the textual evidence, we will examine some of the important records from the period of or just before the purported Exodus event, including a group of documents from the Egyptian city of Amarna. You might remember from the historical chapters in Dr. Bowen's Volume 1 that the Amarna period and the documentation that it produced are incredibly important. When it comes to understanding the land of Canaan during the second half of the second millennium BCE, what do these texts tell us about the period in which Israel was supposed to have escaped Egypt and eventually entered the land of Canaan? We will then move into some of the archeological evidence that informs discussions about the Exodus. Do we have material remains that indicate that 2.5 million people left Egypt and stayed in the area of Kadesh Barnea for nearly 40 years? Is it reasonable to conclude that such a group of people could even have left Egypt without showing up in the textual record? What about the names of cities and regions appearing in the biblical text? Do they line up with what we know from the late second millennium BCE? Does the root of the Exodus and the wanderings as portrayed in the Hebrew Bible match what archaeology tells us? Once grounded in the written and archaeological evidence, we will lay out and examine some of the more seminal interpretations of the data with respect to the Exodus. These are approaches that have been influential and came to be widely adopted positions, either among academics or non-specialists. As such, it is important to at least provide an overview of them individually. A final note before we dive in. This chapter is not intended to provide the redder with the correct interpretation of the data concerning the Exodus. There are good scholars who hold to a range of different interpretive models on the basis of the same evidence. Instead, as is the case in many of the chapters in this series, my goal is to not only provide you with the textual and archaeological evidence, but also to identify and explain the consensus positions. From a variety of perspectives, most scholars continue to hold that the traditional interpretation of the Old Testament story, that 2.5 million people escaped from Egypt following a series of plagues inflicted upon the Pharaoh and his nation, is not historically tenable. In fact, the evidence strongly suggests that no single event likely stands behind the Exodus story. Instead, there may be multiple events, or perhaps no particular event, that form the basis for the story of the Israelite deliverance from Egypt. We will see several competing interpretations of the data, but it will become clear that the story described in the Old Testament cannot stand up to the historical scrutiny of any of them. The Story of the Exodus Let my people go. In the story, Moses, the reluctant messenger of Yahweh, stands before the Pharaoh and demands the release of the oppressed Israelites. If you were to ask someone on the street to tell you the story of the Exodus, you would probably be able to extract the basic plot. Of course, our purpose in this documentary is not to settle for the basic plot. We want to begin our investigations into each of these hot button issues by thoroughly understanding the overall context of the narrative that the Old Testament is telling. To this end, I would like to tell the story of the Exodus in greater detail. More specifically, I will pay close attention in the latter parts of the story to the paths of travel and specific place names that appear in the text. This will allow the viewer to more effectively align our discussions in the rest of this video with the events as depicted in the narrative. The story of the Exodus begins with Joseph moving the remainder of his family down to Egypt. Exodus 1, 1 to 5. Thanks to some brilliant administrative maneuverings, his family has prospered in the area called Goshen, ostensibly in the eastern part of the Nile Delta. However, Joseph, his brothers, and all of the family members that immigrated to Egypt eventually die off, and after several subsequent generations, a new, unnamed pharaoh comes to power. 
This Pharaoh is unaware of the events that transpired during the life of Joseph. He does not see the Israelites, who are beginning to greatly increase in number, as allies, but as potential enemies. In order to ensure that these multiplying Israelites will not turn on the Egyptians in a time of war, the Pharaoh devises a strategy for control. He will enslave them. Exodus 1, 9, 9 11. Initially, it seems as though the plan will suffice. However, we see that the harder the Pharaoh makes life for the children of Israel, the faster they multiply in number. This causes the Egyptians increased anxiety about these now unwelcome guests, and they oppress them more harshly. However, this does not work as well as the Egyptians hope, leading the Pharaoh to supplement his plan. The Pharaoh instructs the midwives that are responsible for aiding the Hebrew, an ethnic designation for the Israelites, women in giving birth, to kill any boys that they deliver. Exodus 1, 15, 16. The midwives are said to fear God, so they refuse to carry out the Pharaoh's order. When confronted, the midwives excuse their insubordination by explaining that the exceptionally hardy Hebrew woman were able to give birth on their own, so the midwives had no occasion to kill the newborn boys after delivering them. Undeterred, the pharaoh then extends the command to kill all newborn males to the entire Egyptian population. Anyone who finds an Israelite baby boy is to throw him into the Nile. It is into this rather dire situation that Moses is born. Moses' mother, who was from the tribe of Levi, secretly gives birth to him and keeps him hidden for three months. Exodus 2, 1-2 When it becomes impossible to conceal him any longer, she makes a small basket and sets him adrift in the river, where he floats down to where the daughter of the Pharaoh is bathing. When she sees Moses, she decides to keep him, even though she realizes that he is an Israelite. Likely, by design, Moses' sister, Miriam, approaches the princess and offers to go and fetch a Hebrew woman to come and be a wet nurse for the baby. The happy result of this is that Moses' mother, after having been forced to give up her son for fear of him being killed by the Egyptians, not only saves her son's life, but is then hired by the household of the Pharaoh himself to raise him. Such miraculous intervention sets the tone for the life of Moses. The story then skips ahead to Moses as an adult, a high-ranking member of the Pharaoh's house. Moses sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew and seeking to protect his countrymen, he kills the Egyptian and buries his body. Exodus 2, 11, 12. The following day, Moses sees two Israelites fighting with one another. When he attempts to defuse the situation, one of the men asks Moses who made him their judge, and will he kill them as he'd killed the Egyptian man? As you might imagine, this terrifies Moses, who then flees from Egypt into the desert of Sinai, fearful that he will invite retribution for his actions. The events that occur between Moses fleeing from and returning to Egypt are largely irrelevant to our purposes, but we should note that while in the desert, Yahweh appears to Moses from a burning bush and commissions him to speak to Pharaoh on his behalf. It takes some convincing, but eventually Moses agrees. After appearing before the elders of Israel and showing them the signs that Yahweh had equipped him to perform, the elders believe. Moses and his brother Aaron then make their way to the Pharaoh. In their first encounter with the Pharaoh, Moses requests that he let the Israelites go out from the land to celebrate a feast to Yahweh in the wilderness. Exodus 5, 1. However, the Pharaoh is not moved to send the people off to worship their God. Rather, he questions how the Israelites have enough free time to consider going on such an excursion. To relieve the people of their idle time, he sets quotas of bricks to be produced each day, but no longer provides the people with the straw required to make the bricks. As you might imagine, with the added time and energy required to find and gather straw, the Israelites are not able to meet their daily quotas. This leads to beatings by 
their Egyptian taskmasters. Of course, this does not endear the elders and the people to Moses and Aaron, whom they understandably hold responsible for this bad turn of events. Moses returns to Yahweh and cries out to him, which causes God to begin to move against Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Exodus 6, one. After promising Moses that he will harden the Pharaoh's heart, work miraculous signs, and bring the people of Israel out of Egypt, Yahweh sends the reluctant Moses back to Pharaoh to again demand that the people be released. Moses and Aaron perform a magical demonstration of divine power before the Pharaoh, but he is unimpressed. Yahweh prepares to send the first plague against Egypt. The first plague consists of turning the water of Egypt into blood. Exodus 7.20 With the Pharaoh standing down by the river, Moses again commands him on God's behalf to let the people go. Should he refuse? Moses will turn the Nile, along with all the water in Egypt, to blood. Should he refuse? Pharaoh refuses, and the plague is carried out. However, Pharaoh remains unmoved, and he returns to his house, leaving the plague to spoil the land for seven days. The second plague, frogs, follows much the same course. Only this time, the Pharaoh pleads with Moses to remove the frogs, promising that he will allow the people to go and worship Yahweh. Exodus 8. 8. However, when when the plague ends, the Pharaoh changes his mind. The third plague, lice, does nothing to move the Pharaoh, but the fourth, flies, changes his mind. He tells them to go and sacrifice without leaving the country. The Pharaoh is at first persuaded to let them go a short distance outside of Egypt. But again, when the plague is removed, he changes his mind and refuses to let the people go as promised. The Pharaoh is unmoved by the fifth and sixth plagues, diseased cattle, and boils. Exodus 8.28. During the seventh plague, hail, Yahweh reveals to Pharaoh that he is bringing these punishments upon Egypt to show his power. In this instance, Yahweh promises to bring down hail upon the land. Anyone who believes will bring their animals in from the weather. Those who do not will suffer their loss. Following the destructive downpour of hail mixed with fire, the Pharaoh urgently pleads with Moses to have Yahweh relent. However, when the plague stops, the Pharaoh once again changes his mind. Some progress appears to be made leading up to the eighth plague, locusts. Moses and Aaron again demand the release of the people, and even the Pharaoh's servants take up their cause entreating the Pharaoh to let them go. Exodus 10, 7. The Pharaoh agrees, but only so far as to allow the adult males to depart. Yahweh then sends the plague of locusts, which brings the immediate response of contrition from the Pharaoh, once again to see him change his mind when the locusts are removed. This leads to the ninth plague, which comes with no warning to the Pharaoh. Darkness falls upon the land for three days, after which the Pharaoh attempts to strike a bargain, take the women and children, but not the animal. Moses refuses, and the Pharaoh becomes enraged, threatening that he will kill Moses if he ever sees his face again. This leads to the final and most devastating of the ten plagues, the death of the firstborn, Exodus 11. Before sending the plague, the people are to ask for articles of silver and gold from their Egyptian neighbors, whom Yahweh has caused to be predisposed toward them. Moses commands the people to take a young lamb, kill it, and sprinkle some of the blood on the lintels and doorposts of their houses. Yahweh has dispatched his angel to take the life of every firstborn child. However, when Yahweh passes by the house and sees the blood on the door, he will pass over that place and move on to the next. Following this night of death throughout all Egypt, Pharaoh finally relents and commands Moses and all the children of Israel to take their livestock and leave. We now get the first references to specific places that the people journey. This will lay important groundwork for the remainder of this chapter. The Israelites have been living in the land of Goshen, in the Nile Delta, and they travel from Ramesses to Sukkoth, Exodus 12:37. The text reports that there are 600,000 men, 
in addition to children, and that they leave after living in Egypt for 430 years. Exodus 12, 37, 40. We also see in Exodus 13, 17, 20, that the path of the Exodus does not go north along the more direct route by way of the land of the Philistines but rather through the wilderness by the Red Sea. The Israelites leave Sukkoth and travel to Etham. In chapter 14, Yahweh commands Moses to have the people camp before Pihahiroth, which is between Migdol and the sea, before Baal Zephon, Exodus 14.2. This place of encampment will lead the Pharaoh to believe that the Israelites are trapped by the desert, prompting him to pursue his former slaves. As the Egyptian army approaches, the Israelites panic and fear that they will die in the wilderness. Moses then parts the sea and the people pass through on dry ground. When the Egyptians pursue, however, Moses causes the waters to return and the Egyptian army drowns. Earliest references to the Exodus and Israel. In hearing the title to this section, you might be tempted to think if we want to see the earliest references to the Exodus, we can just read the story as it appears Book of Exodus, right? However, after a bit of reflection and thinking about what we have said in this series, it is clear that we cannot simply assume that the books of the Pentateuch are the earliest in the Hebrew Bible simply because they come first in order. The earliest references to the Exodus appear to come from small portions of the Pentateuch and from some of the early Hebrew prophets. We will examine several references to the Israelites leaving Egypt in Exodus 15, the Song of the Sea, and Numbers 23-24, the Oracles of Balaam, as well as in the prophetic books of Hosea and Amos. What do these texts say about the Exodus, and what can they tell us about what the early Israelites knew or understood about the event? Finally, while it is not with reference to the Exodus from Egypt, the earliest known mention of the Israelites is an important piece of information in this discussion. At the end of the 13th century BCE, Pharaoh Meneptah identified a group of people known as Israel in a stele that recorded his victory over several groups in Canaan. We will examine this well-known inscription and determine how it can add to our understanding of the Exodus. The earliest references in the Pentateuch. While we know that the Pentateuch as a whole does not comprise the earliest texts in the Hebrew Bible, there are a few portions of text that are generally regarded as older than what surrounds them. Two of these passages are Exodus 15 and Numbers 23 Tosh and 24. The former passage contains the so-called Song of the Sea, in which Yahweh is said to have destroyed the Egyptian army. In the latter, Numbers 23 to 24, we read the oracles of Balaam, the seer who was hired to curse the nation of Israel in their journey out of Egypt. Both of these are considered by scholars to be among the most ancient pieces of literature in the Hebrew Bible, and we will examine each in turn below to see what they reveal about the earliest Exodus traditions. Exodus 15, the Song of the Sea. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to Yahweh, and they said, I will sing to Yahweh, for he is highly exalted. He threw the horse and its rider into the sea. Yah is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. The God of my father, and I will exalt him. Yahweh is a man of battle. Yahweh is his name. The chariots of Pharaoh and his army he threw into the sea, and the best of his officers were drowned in the Suf Sea. The deeps cover them. They descended into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Yahweh, is glorious in strength. Your right hand, O Yahweh, beats down the enemy, and in the greatness of your loftiness, you throw down the ones who rise up against you. You send out your anger, and it consumes them like chaff. And by the air of your nostrils, the waters were piled up. The flowing water stood up like a heap. The deeps were congealed in the midst of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, overtake, and divide the plunder. 
My gullet will be filled with them. I will unsheath my sword. My hand will dispossess them. You blew with your breath. The sea covered them. They sank like lead into the mighty waters. Who is like you among the gods, O Yahweh? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, awe-inspiring in praises, performing marvelous things? You stretched out your right hand. The ground swallowed them. You led in your loving kindness this people that you redeemed. You guided them by your power to your holy residence. The peoples heard and now tremble. Fear has seized those dwelling in Philistia. Then the tribal chiefs of Edom were terrified. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All those dwelling in Canaan were disheartened. Terror and trembling fall upon them. By the great power of your arm, they stand as still as a stone. Until your people, O Yahweh, cross over. Until this people, whom you purchased, cross over. You will bring and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. A place of your dwelling you have made, O Yahweh. A sanctuary, O Lord, your hands have established. Yahweh will reign forever and ever. Exodus 15, 1 to 18. The poem found in Exodus 15 describes the great power of Yahweh as he triumphed over the Egyptian pharaoh, defeating his army by throwing them into the sea. There are actually two poems in the chapter. The verses translated are referred to as the Song of the Sea, while V. Sing to Yahweh, for he is highly exalted. He threw the horse and its rider into the sea. Is identified as the Song of Miriam. For our purposes, the material point is the dating of the Song of the Sea. There is a wide spectrum of opinion on the matter. Scholars like Brian Russell argue, The poetry of Exod 15, V 1 BD 18, 21b, was composed approximately 1150 BCE in the early years of Israel's existence. On the other end of the spectrum are scholars like Brenner, who argue that the poem dates to a period after the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem in the late 5th century BCE. It would seem, however, that most biblical scholars date the Song of the Sea earlier, identifying it as archaic biblical Hebrew. Dr. Gianto writes, A precise date cannot be assigned to ABH, Archaic Biblical Hebrew. It can be assumed that the original speech community of ABH is the early Israelite society, and early traditions are preserved in a number of poems in the Hebrew Bible. These poems form the corpus of ABH. The divine warrior and his acts are exalted in Exod 15.1.18, the Song of the Sea. If the poem does indeed date to an earlier period in Israelite history, what can we learn from its content? What was the Exodus tradition as reflected in the text, if any? Everyone agrees that the Song of the Sea depicts Yahweh as a divine warrior. He defeats the Egyptian army by casting the horse and its rider into the sea. It is also clear that, as implied above, the poem itself was not originally part of the narrative that surrounds it. Dr. Dozman writes, There is no indication that the songs were associated with Moses or Miriam in their original composition, yet both are now thoroughly embedded in the larger narrative context. While some of the expected components of the Exodus story are present in the poem, others may not be. For example, Dozman notes, There is no crossing of the sea on dry ground in the Song of the Sea. Instead, Yahweh destroys the enemy in the sea, sending them to the underworld. Dr. Stephen Russell argues that, in fact, the Song of the Sea did not, in its original, independent form, refer to the Exodus at all. He writes, In sum, Exod 15, 15-17 does not presuppose an Exodus event. Neither is there any reference to an Exodus from Egypt anywhere else in the poem. It seemed that the Song of the Sea, a poem that likely dates relatively early in Israel's history, speaks to a conflict between Yahweh and Egypt in which the Pharaoh's army was thrown into the sea. Because this poem was originally independent of the surrounding narrative, the narrative of the Exodus, and was inserted into the canonical version of the text, there may not be a one-to-one -one correspondence between what is depicted in the poem and what is seen in the final Exodus story. In fact, it appears that some or many of the details in the canonical story are not reflected in the poem, and that the later writers simply integrated the poem into the narrative on the basis of its description of Yahweh's victory over Egypt and the Pharaoh. Numbers 23 and 24, the oracles of Balaam. The 
Israelites journey from Egypt to Canaan, the king of Moab, Balak, hires a diviner named Balaam to come and curse the very large group of Israelites. However, instead of cursing Balak's enemies, Balaam blesses them. Portions of these oracles pronounced by Balaam contain references to the Exodus event, specifically in Numbers 23, 22, and 24, 8, we see the same refrain repeated. El, who delivers them from Egypt, has horns, like horns of a wild ox. It is this allusion to the Exodus to which we now turn. When were the oracles of Balaam written? As with the Song of the Sea, they also likely date to a relatively early period in Israel's history. Dr. Russell summarizes, While the arguments for a premonarchic date may not be compelling, there is reasonable evidence to suggest that the oracles date to the 8th century BCE or earlier. And as with Exodus 15, Dr. Gianto assigns the Balaam oracles to archaic biblical Hebrew. There are several lines of argumentation that scholars use to date these oracles early, perhaps during the 9th or 8th centuries BCE, although these will not occupy our attention here. Perhaps it is sufficient to quote Dr. Prop. Without considerable apologies and gymnastics, we cannot date the oracles of Balaam earlier than the 9th century BCE. If the Balaam oracles also preserve a relatively early tradition of the Exodus, what is it that is preserved in the text? First, we see that the god El is spoken of in these verses as well as throughout the rest of the oracles. Indeed, there appears to be a distinction made between Yahweh and El, the chief Canaanite deity throughout the oracles. Second, scholars have noted the use of the Hebrew verb to deliver, bring out, 23.22 and 24.8, which comes from the verbal root yatsa. This verb is on the whole pretty common. It is used generally to describe people going out from or to a particular place. For example, in Genesis 19.6, and Lot went out to them at the doorway, but the door he shut behind him. However, there is another nuance that this verb can take when it appears in context about slavery. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere with this. For example, in Exodus 21, 2, we read, If you buy a Hebrew slave, six years he will serve, and in the seventh he will go out free, without payment. Perhaps more telling is Exodus 21, 7, which states, and if a man sells his daughter as a female slave, she will not go out like the male servants. It is clear from these verses that the verb to go out can carry the nuanced meaning of to be released from slavery, a theme that is clearly present in the Exodus narrative. As Dr. Dozman writes, The literary relationship between the law of debt slavery and the story of the Exodus is further reinforced by the verb to go out as the description of release from slavery. Based on the use of this verb in the Balaam oracles, Dr. Russell also writes, This verb in the Egypt formula seems to bear the nuance of a movement from a state of oppression to a state of freedom. In some sense, Egypt was perceived as a former overlord of Israel. Turning back to the refrain in the Balaam oracles, in Numbers 23, 22, and 24 and 8, El, who delivers them from Egypt, has horns like horns of a wild ox. We can see that this nuanced reading of the verb yatsa seems to contain a memory of Israel being delivered from some type of slavery in Egypt. Dr. Milgram argues that this refrain emphasizes that the Lord is the true source of their freedom. In short, we have seen that Exodus 15 appears to contain the memory of a military victory of Yahweh over Egypt and perhaps a conquest into the land, while the Balaam oracles appear to preserve a memory of El as the God who delivered Israel from bondage. Dr. Russell argues that the Balaam oracles attest to an Egypt tradition that focused on the idea of liberation from Egyptian oppression, rather than on the idea of a journey of Israelites out of Egypt into Syria, Palestine. The prophets Hosea and Amos We have seen that two poetic passages in the Pentateuch, Exodus 15 and Numbers 23-24,
appear to date to a period earlier than the narrative in which they are embedded. While we cannot be certain of how early they date, scholars generally agree that the poems go back to at least the 8th century BCE. Other references to the Exodus appear in prophetic books that also date to the 8th century, Hosea and Amos. There are numerous references to the Exodus story in these two prophetic books, and it is certainly not my intention to provide commentary on each of the passages in question. However, it is important for our purposes to recognize that these 8th century prophets were aware of Exodus traditions, although they might not agree precisely on the story or its theological implications. Dr. Grab writes, Although we could debate some of these passages, overall, the Exodus tradition seems to be presupposed, though it would take us back only to the 8th century, long after the alleged event. Whatever the reality, it is clothed in a thick layer of mythical interpretation. Let's begin with the book of Hosea. Several verses seem to refer to an Exodus tradition, implying that it was already regarded as a significant event in Israel's past by the time of Assyria's incursions into the region. Dr. Hoffman writes of these texts in Hosea. This high concentration of references to the Exodus cannot be a mere coincidence. It rather represents the central position of this tradition in Hosea's view. Indeed, a close inspection proves that Hosea regarded the Exodus as the most important event in the history of the covenant between Yahweh and his people. Some of the verses that speak of an Exodus event are Hosea 2.14-15. Therefore, I am about to allure her and bring her to the wilderness, and I will speak to her heart. And I will give her vineyards to her from there, and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. Then she will answer there, as in the days of her youth, and as in the day that I brought her up from the land of Egypt. Hebrew 16 to 17. The use of the verb to bring up is significant here. It is arguably a reference to settlement in the land of Israel. Dr. Dearman notes that this verb is part of the confessional language that God had brought Israel up out from Egypt. A similar idea is seen in Hosea 12, 13, Hebrew 12, 14. And by a prophet, Yahweh brought Israel up from Egypt, and by a prophet, he was guarded. There is also a reference to the Exodus that is set in the context of a prohibition against the worship of molten images, Hosea 13, 2, 4. In this passage, the speaker declares, I myself am Yahweh your God from the land of Egypt. Hosea 13.4. Dr. Russell sets the context of this passage relative to the stories, the golden calves in Exodus 32 and of Jeroboam's idols at Bethel and Dan in 1 Kings 12. He concludes, This nexus of connections, and especially Hos 13.2.4, suggests that there was a well-known association between the calves, Bethel, and the Exodus by the 8th century B.C. In other words, it seems clear that whatever the details of the story that were remembered or understood, the prophet Hosea knows some form of the Exodus tradition and considers it central to Israel's history. Turning to the book of Amos, again, we see several references to an Exodus from Egypt, including Amos 2, 10, and 11, 3, 1, and 9, 7. Scholars debate whether some or all of these passages are actually later in date, the result of an editing process during the exilic or post-exilic period. For example, in his commentary on Amos 2.910, Dr. Idaval argues, There are thus good reasons to assume that verses 10 should be ascribed to an exilic or post-exilic redaction informed by Deuteronomistic ideology. Arguably, the same applies also to those passages in Amos that contain similar phrases, namely 3.1, 5-25, and 9.7. Dr. Russell posits the early date of at least some of this Exodus material. In general, I have taken the references to Egypt in Hosea and Amos to reflect authentic traditions that predate the Assyrian invasion of Israel in 722 BCE, unless there are clear reasons for regarding the reference or its context as coming from a later period. Regardless, and for the sake of argument, we will assume the latter position, counting these references in Amos as originating in the 8th century. Let's take a look 
at some of these references to the Exodus tradition in Amos. 2.10 And I myself brought you up from the land of Egypt, and I led you in the desert forty years to possess the land of the Amorite. 3.1 Listen to this word that Yahweh has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the entire clan that I brought up from the land of Egypt. 9.7 are you not like the children of Cush to me, O children of Israel, says Yahweh? Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Kafta, and the Arameans from Kir? If these verses date to the 8th century BCE, it would seem that the tradition in Amos, at a minimum, speaks of Yahweh bringing the nation of Israel up from Egypt and leading them through the wilderness. It is interesting to note that the verb to bring up is used in Hosea and Amos rather than the verb to bring out, as we saw in Numbers 23 and 24. This may indicate that the prophets did not necessarily associate the exodus with deliverance from enslavement, Russell argues. In fact, there is no explicit evidence in Hosea and Amos that Israel's time in Egypt was remembered as a period of slavery. Instead, Israel's exodus is described with a verb of motion rather than with a verb of freedom. Whether the traditions were relatively consistent in content, if these passages were original to the prophet, this would provide further evidence that there was indeed a memory of the exodus during the 8th century. The Merneptah Stele, earliest reference to Israel. Before we examine the historical and archaeological evidence concerning the Exodus, I would like to briefly highlight another early reference, not to the Exodus tradition, but to Israel itself, the Merneptah Stele, dating to the end of the 13th century BCE, circa 1207 BCE. This relief from the Karnak Temple features victories of Pharaoh Merneptah and seems to speak of Israel in its earliest stage. The chiefs are thrown flat and say, peace. Not one of them lifts his head among the nine bows. Chehenu is seized. Kata is pacified. Pekanan, Gaza, is plundered most grievously. Ashkelon is brought in and Gaza captured. Yeno Am is turned into something annihilated. Israel is stripped bare, wholly lacking seed. Karu has become a widow for Egypt and all lands are together at peace. Anyone who stirs is cut down by the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Merneptah. There are obviously a great number of things that we could say about this inscription. For our interest is set on the explicit mention of Israel in line 27 to show that this was an identifiable people group in Canaan by at least the end of the 13th century. This inscription will come up again later in our discussion of the Exodus as it is an important piece of data concerning things like the size or status of Israel, along with their relationship to Egypt during this period. Nevertheless, this early reference to Israel shows that they were certainly present in Canaan by 1207 BCE and a group that was considered significant enough for mention in a victory relief. What can we say? Having examined some of the earliest textual references to both the Exodus traditions and to Israel itself, what can we conclude? Apart from the debate concerning the dating of several of the passages we have discussed above, it seems that the evidence allows us to say that some of the traditions concerning an Exodus are relatively early, dating at least as far back as the 8th century BCE, though perhaps earlier. It also would appear that there was not a unified tradition from which the various writers drew. For example, the Song of the Sea in Exodus 15 appears to differ, in some respects, from what is seen in the Oracles of Balaam in Numbers 23-24. These, in turn, may contain further differences from what we find in the early prophets Hosea and Amos. The important takeaway here is that these early references to the Exodus and to Israel in the Merneptah Stile suggest that early writers were already in possession of traditions about an exodus from Egypt that formed an important part of their national history.
Egyptian evidence for the Exodus. We have examined what some of the earliest biblical sources appear to say about the Exodus event and looked at the earliest non-biblical reference to Israel. But what can we understand of the Exodus from extra-biblical sources that come from Egypt itself? If nearly three million slaves walked out of Egypt, we would expect that someone would have noticed. In this section, we will evaluate Egyptian textual and archaeological data for evidence concerning the Exodus. Textual Evidence from Egypt We don't have much textual data from Egypt that is useful in determining the reality and or details of an Exodus event. There are no records that describe a group of Israelites crossing the border out of Egypt, and we have no inscriptions that indicate that such an event took place. Dr. Grabby puts it this way. There is nothing in Egyptian texts that could be related to the story in the book of Exodus. There is no period in the second half of the second millennium BCE. When Egypt was subject to a series of plagues, death of children, physical disruption of the country, and the loss of huge numbers of its inhabitants. However, there are two groups of texts that should be examined in this discussion. The Amarna letters and several Egyptian papyri. The Amarna letters in the second half of the second millennium BCE, particularly during the 14th century, 1400 when 1300 BCE. International diplomacy increased among various nations throughout the ancient Near East, including Assyria, Babylonia, Egypt, Mitanni, Hadi, Arzawa, and Alashia. This time is known as the Amarna period, named after Tel El Amarna, the site in Egypt where nearly 400 cuneiform tablets were found that reveal to us details about these international relationships. These tablets were part of a royal archive and can primarily be divided into two groups. The first group of approximately 44 tablets consists of letters between the kings of the major powers at the time, most prominently Assyria, Babylonia, and Egypt. The rest of the letters contain correspondence between the pharaoh and vassal rulers from the land of Canaan, which was then under the control of Egypt. This latter group of vassal correspondence between the pharaoh and his subjects in Canaan will be our focus in this discussion. The situation in Canaan that is depicted in the letters is one of small city-states ruled by petty kings. These local potentates write to the pharaoh with frequent requests for assistance and warning of treason being committed by their rival city-state rulers. The pharaoh administered the region by placing Egyptian officials over different parts of Canaan and Syria. Dr. Moran describes the political makeup in this manner. At the time of the Amarna letters, the area was divided into two or three provinces, each under an Egyptian official, who is in the Amarna letters without specific title. Probably always a member of the military, he resided in a garrison city, one of a network, and from there he looked after Egyptian interests in the city states and crown lands within his territory. The nature of the letters themselves further demonstrates the subordinate situation of these local city-state rulers under the administrative structure imposed by Egypt. Dr. Moran writes, From these letters, confirmed by letters of the vassals to the king, one sees that the main purpose of the king's writing was to acquire personnel and other goods to introduce Egyptian officials and secure obedience to their orders, and to arrange for supplies for his troops. The rest of the vassal correspondence is concerned almost exclusively with letters from subordinate rulers or vassals to the king or high Egyptian officials. Dr. Killebrew concurs. The texts, especially the Amarna letters and the Egyptian military annals, present a less uniform and unified socio-political picture testifying to a low degree of integration and central organization, each city being ruled by its own king. The political situation seems to be volatile, 
with Canaanite rulers frequently requesting Egyptian intervention to settle disputes between various urban centers. What does this mean for our understanding of the Exodus? For those who hold to a 15th century BCE Exodus, the Amarna letters make this position almost completely untenable. Essentially, the Israelites would have left Egypt, wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and entered the land of Canaan, which was under the control of the Egyptians. By the end of the 12th century BCE, Egyptian influence had waned, as Dr. Killebrew notes. Egyptian influence is evident in Canaan through much of the 12th century. However, by the middle of the century, Egyptian prestige was battered and in decline. The situation depicted in the Amarna letters led to Dr. Grab's conclusion. Those who argue for an Israelite exodus in the Late Bronze, or even earlier, often ignore the Amarna tablets. What seems clear to me is that no entrance of Israel into the land could have taken place before the time of the events described in these texts. Egyptian Papyri In addition to the Amarna tablets, there are a few Egyptian papyri that seem to present circumstances that are consistent with aspects of the canonical form of the Exodus story. We will briefly examine two of these in this section. Papyrus Anastasi the Phaix and Six. These New Kingdom scribal exercise letters, dated to the 13th century BCE, contain information that appears to correspond to certain details that are presented in the Exodus story. Let's take a look at some of these details. In Papyrus Anastasi V, we see a report of two workers who had fled Egypt. The text describes the route that they took in their escape. Dr. Allen notes, Their route suggests they were Asiatics rather than Egyptians, attempting to escape to Canaanite territory. That the passage in question reads as follows. I was sent from the broad halls of the king's house, LPH, life, prosperity, and health, on Thur Harvest 9 at the time of evening, after those two workers. When I reached the fortress of Cheku on Thur Harvest 10, they told me they are reporting from the south, that they passed on three harvest ten. When I reached the fort, they told me, the groom has come from the desert, saying, they have passed the wall of the tower of Seti Mernipta, LPH, beloved like Seth. Malamat identified four parallels between this text and what the Hebrew Bible reports concerning the Exodus. First, slaves are reported to have escaped from the city of Rameses. Second, the text reports that the Egyptian military pursued the runaway slaves. Third, the route that the slaves took appears to correspond with the biblical account. Ramesses, Jeku, Sukkah, Migdal, and then north of Migdal. Finally, the slaves fled at night. Obviously, some of these parallels seem to be less meaningful than others, like slaves running away at night. Nevertheless, it does show that attempts by slaves to escape captivity in Egypt did occur and that this did not go unnoticed by Egyptian officials who pursued them in order to return them to their masters. Papyrus Anastasi VI may also inform this discussion on the Exodus. It describes the movement of Edomite pastoralists across the border into Egypt to water their flocks. The text reads, Another information for my lord that we have just let the Shasu tribes of Edom pass the fortress of Menepta Hetefermat, LPH of Cheku, to the pool of Pithom of Menepta Hetefermat, of Cheku, in order to revive themselves and revive their flocks. From the great life force of Pharaoh, LPH, the perfect son of every land, in Regnal year 8, third epigominal day, the birth of Seth. I have sent them in a copy of report to where my lord is, together with the other names of days, on which the fortress of Mernepta, Hetefermat, LPH, life, prosperity, and health of Jeku was passed. Concerning this text, Dr. Allen writes, The letter refers to the arrival of Bedouin and their flocks from the northern Sinai desert at one of the Egyptian border fortresses erected during the Ramside period, as such, it reflects the careful control that Egypt exercised during this period on traffic in and out of the Eastern Delta. 
The movements reported here should be included in the Exodus discussion in that they suggest that movement was allowed into Egypt, although this movement was apparently documented and controlled. While there are other papyri that can potentially provide additional information, these two should suffice for our purposes. As you can see from these brief summaries, we appear to have some supporting evidence for aspects of the Exodus story. However, it is clear that these data alone indicate nothing more than that such things as runaway slaves and movements of people groups into Egypt were known during this period. One cannot conclude from these papyri that the Exodus is therefore historically reliable. Archaeological Evidence from Egypt In addition to textual evidence that contributes to our understanding of an exodus, archaeological findings are essential to formulating a proper reconstruction of the event. In what follows, we will examine some of the most common pieces of evidence that appear in the discussion. First, we will consider the number of people that were reported to have participated in the exodus from Egypt in the Hebrew Bible. We will then discuss the control that Egypt enforced on its borders and how this bears on the story of the Exodus. Finally, we will retrace the purported route of the Exodus and the wanderings through the wilderness to see if these sites can be identified and if they conform to the story as presented in the Bible, particularly with respect to the date that the Exodus event is supposed to have taken place. How many people left Egypt? Perhaps the first and most important question that arises with respect to the archaeological evidence for the Exodus concerns the number of people that are purported to have left Egypt. We read in Exodus 12, 37. And the children of Israel traveled from Ramesses to Sukkoth, approximately 600,000 on foot, the young men besides the young children. In other words, there were 600,000 young men of fighting age who set out from the city of Ramses in Egypt. This does not include, however, the young children or, it would seem, the women. Scholars estimate, therefore, that if women and children were included in the number, there would have been somewhere between two and three million people who would have exited Egypt. Conservative scholars are quick to criticize this conclusion, however. For example, Dr. Kenneth Kitchen writes rather strongly, There is not the slightest reason to credit the common misreading of the Hebrew text in e.g. Exod 1237 as 600,000 and to make it imply two million people. But why is this reading of the text to be rejected. Kitchen argues, Hebrew elef is as ambiguous as English bark, skin of tree, noise of dog, type of ship, being either thousand, family, or other group or leader. In other words, the Hebrew word that is translated thousand is elef, which can be rendered in different ways depending on the context. It is one of these other translations that should be used in this verse. So the argument goes, more recently, Dr. Hoffmeyer has presented this argument against a group of people numbering in the millions. He recognizes the difficulty with such a large number leaving Egypt. Logistically, this is impossible. Egypt's entire population in the New Kingdom is estimated to be just 3 million, while Pyrameses has been reckoned to be 300,000. As with Kitchen, he argues that the Hebrew word Aleph should not be understood as thousand, but rather as a military unit. Unfortunately, this position is not without its problems, not the least of which is the motivation to find a different translation for the word. Listen to Dr. Hoffmeyer's reasoning. One can only conclude that the 600,000 has been misunderstood by translators and commentators until more recent times, when other historical records and archaeological data offer a clearer picture about the sizes of armies and the realities of populations in Egypt and the Levant during the second millennium BC. 
In other words, scholars have thought this meant 600,000 for all this time. But now that we know that there could not have been so many people, the solution must be that everyone has just mistranslated and misunderstood the word, rather than concluding that the text may have just gotten it wrong. Indeed, there are several other passages that indicate that the body of Israelites emerging from Egypt and moving toward Canaan was not only enormous, but matched the figure given in Exodus 12, 37. During their first year in the wilderness, for example, a census was taken of the people. In Exodus 30, 12, 10, 16, we see that in this census, every male 20 years and older was to be counted and was required to give an offering of a half shekel of silver. Later, in Exodus 38, 25, 26, we see that following the census, the silver that was gathered from it was used in the building of the tabernacle. In verses 25 to 26, we read, And the silver of the numbered of the congregation was one 100 talents and 1,775 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. A becker per head, a half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary, for everyone crossing over to those who were numbered from 20 years old and up, for 603,150 men. Exodus 38, 25, 26. Remember, in Exodus 12, 37, the text said that about 600,000 fighting men went out of Egypt. Here, the passage indicates that 100 talents and 1,175 shekels of silver were collected from all those who were 20. Years old and up, the fighting men who would be counted in the census. A little bit of math here. One talent, 3,000 shekels. So 100 talents, 300,000 shekels. Add to this the 1,175 shekels, and you get 1,775 shekels of silver. Stay with me here. If each fighting male was required to give a half shekel of silver when he was counted in the census, that would mean that if we multiply the 301,075 shekels by two, we arrive at the total number of men, 20 years and older, that were counted in the census. 603,550, exactly the number we see in verse 26. When we compare this number to the census that is taken in Numbers 1 to 2, we see that the total number of males 20 years and older came to, you guessed it, 603,550, Numbers 1, 46, and 2, 32. And we are not left to guess how they came to these figures. For example, in Numbers 1, we see the following breakdown by tribes seen on this chart. You have the chart on the left and census on the right. Reuben had 46,500, Simeon had 59,300, Gad had 45,650, Judah had 74,600, Issachar had 54,400. Zebulon had 57,400, Ephraim had 40,500, Manasseh had 32,200, Benjamin had 35,400, Dan had 62,700, Asher had 41,500, and lastly, Naphtali had 53,400, totaling at 603,050 men. In other words, the figure seen in Exodus 12, 37, the approximately 600,000, is paralleled in both Exodus 38 and Numbers 1-2. 603,550. This first census was followed by a census at the end of the wilderness wanderings in Numbers 26, 51. These are the ones where were numbered of the children of Israel, 601,730 men. When you compare the numbers of the individual tribes, you see that some tribes increased in number, while some decreased. In the end, the number 601,730 is not the same as 603,550. Not that we would expect it to be the same after 40 years, but it is close to the approximately 600,000 figure. Another passage is worth noting here. In Numbers 11, the people complain about the food that Yahweh has provided them. They want meat to eat, and Moses complains that the people are too many for him to find meat for them all. Yahweh promises to provide quail for them to eat. And in Numbers 11, 21 and 22, we see Moses' response to this promise. And Moses said, 600,000 on foot are this people whom I am among. And you have said, I will give meat to them that they may eat for an entire month. Will sheep and cattle be slaughtered for them that it may be sufficient for them? 
If all the fish of the sea would be gathered for them, would it be sufficient for them? Numbers 11, 23. Moses' complaint is that given the vast size of the Israelite host, how on earth will Yahweh be able to provide enough meat to feed them all? Flocks of sheep, herds of cattle, even all the fish of the sea, would this be enough? Yahweh's response is fitting. And Yahweh said to Moses, Is the power of Yahweh limited? Numbers 11.23 Finally, we should consider the words of the Moabites in Numbers 22, 1 to 5. And the children of Israel traveled and camped in the plains of Moab, on the other side of the Jordan from Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel did to the Amorites. And Moab was very afraid of the people, because they were numerous. And Moab was horrified of the children of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, now this assembly will lick up everything that is around us, as the bull licks up the grass of the field. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of Moab at that time. And he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, to Petha, which is along the river in the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, A people went out from Egypt, and now they cover the surface of the land, and they are dwelling opposite me. Numbers 22, 1 to 5. The passage describes the Moabites as being very afraid and horrified of the Israelites because they were numerous, Numbers 22, 3. The words used to describe their fear are interesting. For example, Dr. Levine notes that the first word afraid, Hebrew ger, voices extreme fear, the terror of war, Job 19, 29. And what caused this extreme fear? The number of the Israelites. It would seem that the Israelites comprised a massive horde that is encamped opposite the Jordan, threatening the very survival of the Moabites. When we see how the very numerous people who left Egypt are described by the narrative, the straightforward impression is that the reader is intended to understand the Israelite company as a literal 600,000 fighting men, besides women and children. Dr. Prop writes, security at the border. One might argue that here elep means not thousand, but clan or even squad, cf num 31 to 4 to 6, etc. Thus, the number of Hebrew men leaving Egypt could have been much less than 600,000. On the other hand, in num 1121, 6, 100 helipim is imagined to be a huge number, and P records that exactly 625,550 adult men left Egypt, exod 3826, num 339. It seems, therefore, that we must take 1237, num 1121, literally. Getting out of Egypt. A question that we need to ask ourselves is, could a group of slaves, however large you think that group was, have crossed the border of Egypt and done so without leaving a trace? As we saw before, Papyrus Anastasi V, dated to the 13th or even early 12th century, speaks of two workers, Shaksh slaves, who were attempting to escape from Egypt across the border into Canaanite territory. Moreover, in Papyrus, Anastasi VI, we learned that the traffic coming into Egypt was also controlled as shepherds and their flocks from the Sinai entering Egypt to water their animals were tracked. The fact that such attention would be paid to incoming foreigners and their flocks, as well as to slaves attempting to escape from Egypt, suggests that any significant movement of people in or out of Egypt would likely not escape notice in the textual records where such things were apparently documented. Doctors Finkelstein and Silberman have pointed out that following the period of Hyksos rule, CRE 1650-1550 BCE, the borders of Egypt were more carefully patrolled and guarded, they explain. The expulsion of the Hyksos from Egypt in 1570 BCE ushered in a period when the Egyptians became extremely wary of incursions into their lands by outsiders. The Egyptians tightened their control over the flow of immigrants from Canaan into the Delta. They established a system of forts along the Delta's eastern border and manned them with garrison troops and administrators. Furthermore, as we saw in the Amarna letters, the Egyptians remained in control of the land of Canaan until into the 12th century BCE. If we think back to the Merneptah Steli, dated to 1207 BCE, we remember that Merneptah 
fought against several groups in the land of Canaan, still under their control, including Israel. Finkelstein and Silberman described the situation in the 13th century like this. The Egyptian grip over Canaan was firm. Egyptian strongholds were built in various places in the country, and Egyptian officials administered the affairs of the region. They conclude, The border between Canaan and Egypt was thus closely controlled. If a great mass of fleeing Israelites had passed through the border fortifications of the Pharaonic regime, a record should exist. Yet, in the abundant Egyptian sources describing the time of the New Kingdom in general, and the 13th century in particular, there is no reference to the Israelites, not even a single clue. The root of the Exodus and wandering. Nearly 30 years ago, the Egyptologist an archaeologist, Donald Redford, wrote, Whoever supplied the geographical information that now adorns the story of the Exodus had no information earlier than the Sate period, 7th to 6th centuries BC. In other words, when Redford examined the place names, or toponyms, that are recorded in the story of the Exodus, like Goshen, Land of Ramesses, read C, he determined that they did not come from the mid to late 2nd millennium BCE, but rather from centuries later, during the 7th or 6th centuries BCE. This idea has since been challenged by evangelical scholars, perhaps foremost among those arguing for an early date of the names mentioned in the Exodus narrative is the Egyptologist James Hoffmeyer. He has argued in several several publications that the root of the exodus and wilderness wanderings is consistent with what we know of toponyms in the late second millennium BCE Lee. Hoffmeyer's argument focuses on the following major question. Is the picture portrayed in Genesis 39 through Exodus 15 compatible with what is known from Egyptian history? In other words, if we are reading through the Exodus story, do the toponyms that we see reflect an earlier historical context in the 13th century BCE? Or are they more consistent with a later period like the 7th or 6th centuries BCE? Of course, the goal of this section is not to delve into all the archaeological and historical complexities that are involved in this discussion. Instead, I would like to provide an overview of the sites that are under contention and the general positions that scholars take on each. We will examine the cities and places that are mentioned in the Exodus story, followed by those that appear in the wilderness wandering. Before we begin, I would like to point out one of the problematic aspects of this discussion. Let's say that by the end of this section, we are all convinced that the toponyms that appear in the Exodus story indeed fit in a late second millennium BCE context. Where does that get us? Well, it might lend some support to the idea that the Exodus tradition as are early, or perhaps go back to an earlier period. Does it actually tell us anything about the historicity of the events as described in the story? No, it doesn't. In fact, this is also true of much of what we have discussed above, including things like Canaanite slaves and Egypt, people coming to Egypt for sustenance, and slaves escaping to Canaan. Does this demonstrate or even suggest that the essential aspects of the Exodus traditions are true? It does not. In fact, I think Wright, Eliot, and Flesher said it quite well. Did anyone from Canaan ever govern Egypt? Yes. Did herders from the southern Levant bring themselves and their flocks into Egypt? Yes. Did people or armies of Egyptian origins ever invade Canaan and destroy its cities? Yes. Did Egyptians ever enslave Canaanites? Yes. Were there sacred mountains in the Sinai Desert? Yes. Were there groups of people with names like Israel or Hebrews? Yes. Did large numbers of people settle new territory in Canaan? Yes. Is there any non-biblical evidence for worshippers of the God Yahweh? Yes. Unfortunately, the evidence for all these yes answers does not lead us to the single collection of tribes known as the Israelites and their activities over a period of 40 to 45 years. The events and activities comprise a wonderful background setting for the dramatic Exodus story, lending it plausibility but failing to support the historical accuracy of this specific tale. In short, there are many stories that are cast in a historical setting to lend the narrative a type of verisimilitude. However, in a best-case scenario for someone arguing for the historicity of the Exodus
this story, identifying correlations between the toponyms in the narrative and what history and archaeology can tell us about those late second millennium sites will only result in a wonderful background setting for the narrative itself, not in the historicity of the events described. With that caveat in mind, let's begin with Exodus 1.11. And they set over them taskmasters in order to oppress them with hard labor. And they built storage cities for Pharaoh, Pithom, and Ramses. Here, the story speaks of two cities, Pithom and Ramses. This is incredibly problematic for the traditional dating of the Exodus, as these cities were built too late to fit a 15th century date. Klein writes, Archaeological excavations at the sites of these ancient cities indicate that they were begun by Seti the Punas to 590 BC and were completed by Ramses II, circa 1250 BC. There is general agreement that Ramses refers to the site of Kantir, Egyptian, P. Rames, which means the House of Rameses. From a dating perspective, there is an issue with the way in which the name Ramses is written in the Hebrew Bible. In a series of publications, Donald Redford, Wolfgang Helk, James Hawk, James Hoffmeyer and Kenneth Kitchen have debated several issues concerning the historicity of the Exodus. In some of the articles, attention has been drawn to the absence of the prefix pi on the name Ramses, which we would expect given the name of the city is Pyramas. But moreover, in the Hebrew Bible, the prefix does appear on the name of another storage city, Pithom. There is also an issue with the type of S that is used to write Ramses in Hebrew. There are two letters in Hebrew which signal this sound, and where we expect one, it is written with the other. What is the significance of the debate? Why does it matter if the prefix pi appears with the word Ramses, or if the correct type of S is used to write the name. They seem to suggest, as written in the Hebrew Bible, that those who wrote these stories did so. Without first-hand knowledge of the places they describe, in other words, these stories entered into the textual record much later than the Late Bronze Age. For example, concerning not only the use of the type of S in Ramses, but also the form of the name itself. Dr. Redford writes that, This is the distorted vocalization which the Hebrew reflects, not that of the original Bronze Age pronunciation. The rendering of Egyptian Esh, Sin, by Esha Samek, However, demonstrates that the form of the name R.M.S. S.W. entered Hebrew and other West Semitic languages no earlier than the end of the 8th cent. Problems with the identification of the city Pidum are even more glaring than this naming issue. There are two sites that vie for the identification of Pidum, House of Atum, Tel El Mascuda, and Tel Er Ritaba. Doctors Wright, Elliot, and Flesher Wright, B.C. There is no agreement on the location of Pithom. Divided opinion identifies Pithom with the sites of Tel Ritaba or Tel El Mascuta. The site of Tel Ritaba may date to the 13th or 12th century BCE. Its occupation ends in the 7th century BCE as Mascuta was being built. You can see the dating again is a factor in the discussion. If we identify Pithom with Tel Eritaba, then it would seem that the city was occupied sufficiently in the New Kingdom to fit with the Exodus story. However, if Pithom is to be identified with Tel El Mascuta, there is a chronological problem, as the city was not built until the 7th century BCE, at least 500 years after the purported events of the Exodus. In short, as Wright, Eliot, and Flesher put it, if the author of the book of Exodus believed the Israelites built Pithom at Tel El Mascuta, then the story is clearly a 7th century BCE invention. It does not seem as though the matter is yet settled. Dr. Grab summarizes, Most who write on the matter are cautious about identifying Pithom, and there are clearly a number of uncertainties. Evangelical scholars Hoffmeyer, Kitchen, and Biatak all identify Pithom with Teller, Ray Taba. In contrast, Dr. Deaver argues, Pithom, Exod 111, is almost certainly Tel El Mascuta, excavated several times and known to have been occupied in New Kingdom times. There are many other sites that could be discussed in this section, but each one carries with it similar problematic issues, including Succoth, Migdal, and the land of Goshen. 
Again, we must remember that as with the previous sites and their identifications, even if all references were clearly meant to be identified with those of the New Kingdom, this would only serve to show that the background to the story is consistent with the narrative, not the historicity of the events in question. Doctors Wright, Elliot, and Flesher conclude that such a set of identifications simply provides a reasonable context for the setting of the tale, a geographical conclusion rather than a historical one. Before we move out of Egypt and into the wilderness, we should deal briefly with the problem of the Suf Sea. There is no shortage of suggestions for identifying which body of water, if any, is being referred to in the narrative. Dr. Biatak, for example, identified it as the Bala Lakes, arguing that this Yam Suf is in all likelihood identifiable with the Egyptian toponym PYTWF, the papyrus thicket known from the Ramesside period. Dr. Grab, citing a 2011 study by Roskop, observes that Yam Suf is usually a reference to some portion of the Red Sea, but that in the Exodus narrative, it is instead a reference to the Reed Sea, most likely Lake Timsa or the surrounding area in the Suez region. In other words, depending on the context in which Yam Suf occurs, it can refer to different bodies of water. Taking a completely different approach, Dr. Bernard Batto recently argued for a mythological understanding of the Suf Sea. He writes, The Reed Sea hypothesis is flawed and must be given up. Yam Sup should thus be translated as the Sea of End. That is, it is the last sea, the sea situated at the edge of creation. Dr. Bado's argument is complex and deals with the mythological connections between different aspects of the Exodus narrative and other ancient Near Eastern mythologies. Dr. Grab has noted other connections between toponyms in the Exodus story that also appear to be mythologized. For example, let's consider King Og of Bashan, who lived in Ashtarot and Edre, Deuteronomy 1.4, see also Numbers 31.33, and was a descendant of the Rephaim, Deuteronomy 3.11. The Rephaim are customarily understood to be shades or wandering spirits of the dead, Ps 88.11, Prov 9.18, Job 26-5, Isa 26, 14 to 19. If we compare these descriptions to a prayer composed to several deities written in the Ugaritic language from the 13th century, we see the following in the opening lines. May Rapu, king of eternity, drink wine, yea, may he drink, the powerful and noble god, the god enthroned in Atharat, the god who rules in Edre. Both Ashtarot, Atharat in Ugaritic, and Edre are mentioned in this text as the place where Rapu, parallel to the Rephaim in Deuteronomy 3.11, is located. It appears that there is interplay between mythology and toponyms in the narrative. Grabby concludes, Thus, it appears that myth has been historicized, and the shades of the dead have been turned into ethnographical entities. The writer seems at times to have taken traditional or mythical names and used them to create a narrative about ethnic groups. In light of the different ways in which the Suf Sea can be rendered and the mythological character of other toponyms associated with the Exodus, it seems quite reasonable, if not likely, that searching for a specific location for this body of water is misguided. Wright, Elliot, and Flesher conclude, Thus, it appears that myth has been historicized, and the shades of the dead have been turned into ethnographical entities. The writer seems at times to have taken traditional or mythical names and used them to create a narrative about ethnic groups. In light of the different ways in which the Suf Sea can be rendered and the mythological character of other toponyms associated with the Exodus, it seems quite reasonable, if not likely, that searching for a specific location for this body of water is misguided. Wright, Elliot, and Flesher conclude, The quest to identify the physical location of the Yam Suf is fruitless because it has become a place of mythic importance, not geographical location. It was a place where a divine act was believed to have taken place, and that place was remembered or used by different authors in different ways. The archaeological evidence for the rest of the journey out of Egypt and the subsequent wandering in the wilderness is similarly sparse, 
If the Exodus narrative were historically accurate, we would expect to see material culture from this time period at the archaeological sites mentioned in the wilderness wanderings. As you may by now have guessed, such material is sorely lacking. In 2015, Finkelstein summarized his analysis of the archaeological remains from several sites mentioned in the wilderness wanderings. One of these sites was Etzion Geber, Tel El Khalifa, a site to which the Israelites traveled as described in Numbers 33, 35, 36, and Deuteronomy 2.8. Although there may be a few sherds at the site that date to the 12th century BCE, Finkelstein writes, No less important, no 10th century finds have been uncovered at Tel El Khalife. The first significant settlement there was established in the 8th century BCE. In other words, there was no occupation during the time that the Israelites were purported to have arrived, and no material remains suggest that such a group stayed at the site. A similar state of affairs is found at Kadesh Bar Barnea, Tel El Kudirat, an important site within the wandering tradition, which would be expected to contain some diagnostic material culture from the period. However, as Grab writes, any archaeological remains at the site which could help to validate the story are sadly absent. According to the Book of Numbers 10, 11, 12, 16, 13, 26, 21, 22, 33, 36, much of the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness was spent near Kadesh, or Kadesh, or Kadesh Barnea. This and related sites in Sinai and southern Palestine should yield ample evidence of a large population in this region, yet we find nothing. While some of the material culture may date to the 12th century BCE, stratum 4c. It appears that the earliest settlement at the site dates to the 10th century BCE. Deaver writes, There are only three superimposed forts, dating respectively to the 10th, the 8th, and the 7th centuries BCE. Earlier than that, there are no structures, only a scattering of sherds. At most, a few stragglers pass this way in the late 13th or early 12th century BCE. Finkelstein and Silberman explain the situation even more directly. Yet repeated excavations and surveys throughout the entire area have not provided even the slightest evidence for activity in the late Bronze Age. Not even a single sherd left by a tiny fleeing band of frightened refugees. Tying the history and archaeology together. To sum up this section, let's briefly revisit what we've learned. First, Exodus 12.37 tells us that approximately 600,000 fighting men, excluding women and children, made their way out of Egypt. This group of 2-3 million people, by everyone's standards, represents an impossible number. While some have reinterpreted the Hebrew word Aleph thousand as something akin to a military unit and thus a much smaller number, this does not appear to hold and breaks the internal coherence of the narrative. Daver puts it this way. Attempts have been made to understand the Hebrew Aleph thousand as meaning rather hundred, thus reading six thousand or even six hundred. But that is a counsel of despair. Another attempt to explain the unexplainable. We explored the possibility that such a group of Israelite slaves could even have exited Egypt without leaving a trace. As we saw, following the expulsion of the Hyksos, Egypt tightened the security on its borders. We learn from the textual record that movements in and out of Egypt during the late second millennium were apparently closely tracked. Furthermore, during the Amarna period and following, Egypt maintained control over Canaan, complete with a series of forts throughout the region. This would make escape from Egypt into Canaan without detection not only highly unlikely, but somewhat pointless, as they would have been moving from land controlled by Egypt into another land controlled by Egypt. We then turn to some of the different sites that are thought to line the route that the Israelites purportedly took out of Egypt. It turns out that some of the sites may have scant archaeological remains that fit the appropriate time period for an exodus. Other sites, it seems, have no material remains stemming from the necessary periods and therefore cause significant problems for fitting their archaeology together with the biblical narrative. Some common Exodus interpretations. 
We have looked at many of the problems with the historicity of the Exodus story as presented in the Hebrew Bible. I would like to now present some of the more common interpretations of the Exodus story among biblical scholars. The proponents of these ideas generally fall into two camps. Those who think that the events described in the Pentateuch are, at least at some level, historical in nature and those that do not. In what follows, I will attempt to present the consensus position among experts on the Exodus as well as other common positions. We have already mentioned the 2015 edited volume Israel's Exodus in Transdisciplinary Perspective, Text, Archaeology, Culture, and Geoscience several times in this section. And for good reason. This publication is the culmination of research presented at a 2013 conference at the University of California, San Diego. The editors of the volume rightly describe it as the most innovative gathering of thought assembled on the topic of Israel's exodus from Egypt. While more recent publications have been produced on the Exodus since this volume came out, it remains a standard work on the topic. In this volume, Lawrence Girardi contributed an article in which he surveys the various positions of relevant scholars in the field when it comes to the Exodus. At one point, he draws specific attention to the significance of the conference. Indeed, one might say that we have a majority of the consensus-making scholars of the Exodus represented here, assembled all all in one place for the first time in such numbers to discuss the Exodus. In keeping with the procedure for evaluating the events described according to how well they reflect historical reality, Girati distinguishes between the traditional date, 15th century BCE, the consensus date, 13th century BCE, and other theories. So let's take a look at these in broad strokes. The traditional date, 15th century BCE. The traditional date of the Exodus is based on a more literal reading of the Hebrew Bible, and there are several data points that can be joined together to come to a 15th century date for the Exodus. This position was recently defended by Scott Stripling in a 2021 evangelical publication on different views on the Exodus. Let's take a look at some of the key passages and concepts that are used to defend this early dating. In 1 Kings 6 1, we read, now in the 480th year, after the children of Israel came out from the land of Egypt, in the fourth year, in the month of Ziv, that is the second month, of the reign of Solomon over Israel, he built the house of Yahweh. Notice that the text says that the fourth year of Solomon's reign was 480 years after the Israelites left Egypt. Gerardi writes, Most scholars agree that the fourth year of Solomon is circa 970 BCE. If we do the math, we find that 480 years before 970 BCE, or thereabouts, brings us to somewhere around the middle of the 15th century BCE. Dr. Stripling also cites Judges 11.26, which reads, When Israel lived in Heshbon, and in its daughter villages, and in Aroer, and its daughter villages, and in all the cities that are next to Arnon 300 years, why did you not take them back during that time? This story, which takes place during the period of the Judges, is purported to have transpired sometime at the end of the second millennium, perhaps around 1100 BCE. If the Israelites had been living in the land for 300 years prior to the time of the Judges, CA 1100, then this would mean that they came into Canaan around 1400 BCE, a date that would fit well with an exodus in the middle of the 15th century BCE. This traditional date is held by only a small number of biblical scholars at present. In fact, there are both liberal and evangelical scholars alike who are highly critical of this early date. Much of the criticism stems from the archaeological evidence that has come to light concerning this period in Egypt and the southern Levant. Garadi summarizes. The main objection, however, to a 15th century date for the Exodus, other than the nature of the biblical text, relates to the results of excavations at Palestinian cities mentioned in the biblical biblical account. Cities such as Heshbon, Jericho, Ai, Bethel, Debir, and Gibeon. Ad hoc explanations can be supplied for most of these sites, but there is no question that the archaeological evidence is inconclusive at best and problematic at worst. The Consensus Date 
13th century BCE. I need to be very clear about what is meant by the consensus date as described in this section. Someone might read this and say, Aha! You see, scholars agree that there was an actual historical exodus, and it took place in the 13th century BCE. No, actually. Pay close attention to what Gerardi says about this consensus date. But it is primarily the archaeological evidence from excavated Palestinian sites that has been used to bolster the current scholarly consensus that if there was an Israelite exodus from Egypt, it must have occurred sometime in the 13th century BCE. In other words, if an exodus somehow did occur, whatever size and however close to the biblical narrative, it would have occurred in the 13th century BCE. On the more conservative end of the consensus date spectrum would be someone like James Hoffmeyer, who argues for the historical reliability of the Exodus narrative. His most common argument for its historicity during the 13th century centers on how the story accurately represents the historical backdrop of the narrative. He writes, My contention is that if the stage on which the drama of the biblical story is acted out contains authentic sets and props that fit the geographical setting and the chronological parameters, then the plausibility of the narratives is enhanced. While the plausibility of the narrative may be enhanced by an accurate historical backdrop, it is important to note that plausibility is not the same as historical fact. We know that there was a large settlement at the city of Uruk and that King Gilgamesh was an historical figure. But no one argues that because the historical backdrop of the Epic of Gilgamesh is accurate, the feats recounted in that text are historically accurate. The significant hurdles that this position on the Exodus must overcome are those that we discussed in the earlier portion of this chapter. For example, how can the biblical story be historically reliable when it describes 600,000 fighting men exiting Egypt? As we noted above, Hoffmeyer and others argue that the Hebrew word Aleph must mean a much smaller number than 1,000, and thus interpret it as something like a military unit. Similar types of explanations are provided for the earlier dates appearing in the text, like War Kings 6 1 and Judges 11 26, seen before, along with reasons for the absence of any archaeological or textual evidence for the Exodus event as described. A more common 13th century BCE interpretation does not view the biblical story as generally historically reliable, but rather containing a kernel of truth embedded within the historical record that has been remembered and mythology. For example, Dr. Killebrew writes, In light of the lack of evidence in the Egyptian texts and the archaeological remains of an exodus of this magnitude, it is not surprising that scholars have suggested that the exodus does not represent a specific historical moment, but rather numerous exoduses of runaway Asiatic slaves that were telescoped into a single event. We should see it as reflecting a powerful collective memory of the Egyptian occupation of Canaan and the enslavement of its population, which reached its greatest impact during the 13th and 12th centuries BCE. Other theories. Garati lists and briefly describes a number of other theories for the date of the Exodus event as all ranging between the late 3rd millennium BCE and the end of the 8th century BCE. Instead of going through each of these, I would like to focus on some of the more common positions that hold that the Exodus is not a historical event. Let's take a look at the positions of Prop, Hendel, and Finkelstein. William Prop, both in his monumental two-volume commentary on Exodus in the Anchor Yale series, as well as in his 2015 article in the transdisciplinary volume we have been discussing, argues that the Exodus cannot be called historical. On the grounds that the evidence for it is spread out over too long a time period, he lists several lines of evidence from the early to the late second millennium BCE that may correspond to the events as described in the biblical text, but concludes, All this might sound like good news. We have so much evidence of the Exodus. In fact, it is bad news. 
years. An event cannot be spread across half a millennium. While there may be a memory of several events that share similar aspects with the Exodus, Prop argues that the story is not historical, as it cannot even be subjected to the historical method. Similarly, Ronald Hendel has argued that the Exodus is an example of cultural memory, or a representation of the past with present relevance, transmitted by the authoritative texts and interpreters of a particular group. Hendel agrees that several aspects of the Exodus story enhance its verisimilitude. The presence of Canaanite slaves in Egypt, their escape, and the destruction of certain areas in Canaan. However, as with Prop, these details are not to be attributed to a single historical event. Rather, they were often quite standard for much of the second millennium BCE. Instead, Hendel writes, The broad picture of Israel's emergence as a result of escape from Egyptian slavery is best comprehended by the circumstances of Israel's origins in the late Bronze Age Iron Age transition, which the Exodus story purports to describe. Finally, Israel Finkelstein has argued that the text described realities that fit the time of the compilation of the text in the late monarchic to post-exilic days. While still seeing cultural memory as an important factor, Finkelstein argues that the tradition of art of the Exodus, which were primarily northern in nature, were brought to the south following the fall of Samaria to the Assyrians in 722 BCE. The Exodus tradition that was brought from the north, he argues, was elaborated on and transformed in the period of Assyrian domination over Judah, when Judahites became intimately acquainted with places in the desert. This new familiarity with desert toponyms resulted in their inclusion in the newly developing Exodus tradition, explaining why the Exodus story was known to the 8th century BCE prophets, but contained these later elements. The Exodus verdict. We have covered quite a bit of information concerning the Exodus from Egypt, both as it is presented in the narrative of the Hebrew Bible and as it can be understood from historical and archaeological sources. As you have seen, this is not an issue on which biblical scholars and archaeologists are in overwhelming agreement in all the details. Nevertheless, there is certainly a consensus on what the Exodus was not. Before we attempt to draw some general conclusions from the data that we have presented above, let's Let's take a minute and briefly review the contents of the chapter. We began with the narrative itself, the story of the Exodus that the Old Testament presents. It begins with the descent of the Israelites into Egypt and concludes with their deliverance from the Egyptian army by Yahweh's power. But this story on its own is not sufficient to establish the historicity of the events it purports. Although many think that it is, it was necessary to examine the evidence for the events that are described in the story. The first references to the Exodus traditions came from texts in the Hebrew Bible. Perhaps the earliest can be found in Exodus 15, the so-called Song of the Sea, dating at the earliest to the end of the second millennium BCE. These 18 verses present some aspects of the story as it appears in the book of Exodus, but clearly does not contain many of its key features. We next examined the oracles of Balaam, found in Numbers 23-24, which may date to the 9th or 8th centuries BCE. Again, this text appears to show that an Exodus tradition, in some form, was known to the writer, but it is not the complete story as we have it in the book of Exodus. We then reviewed two of the early prophets, Hosea and Amos, and noted the passages in their books that speak of the Exodus from Egypt, as with the Song of the Sea and the Oracles of Balaam, while the prophetic writings appear to date fairly early, 8th century BCE. They do not seem to contain a full or closely parallel version of the Exodus tradition seen in the other texts. Finally, we briefly examined the Merneptah Stele, which is the earliest known reference to a people group known as Israel. While the inscription contains no mention of or allusion to an Exodus tradition, this reference to Israel is important for establishing the existence of a group that self-identified as Israel as early as 1207 BCE. Moreover, this group was significant enough to have been documented by the Egyptian pharaoh in a victory monument. 
following this review of early references to the Exodus traditions, we considered the evidence from Egypt that bears on the Exodus discussion. Beginning with the textual data, we saw that an incredibly important and sometimes overlooked group of texts was found at Tel El Amarna dating to the 14th century BCE. These texts describe interactions between the pharaoh and his vassals in the land of Canaan, making them extremely valuable in determining the state of affairs that existed in Canaan during this period. Among other things, we learned that Canaan was firmly under the control of Egypt during most of the second half of the second millennium BCE. This is very problematic for the Exodus story, as it would require the Israelites to leave a land controlled by Egypt and escape to another land controlled by Egypt. While the Amarna letters do not present supporting evidence for the Exodus story as it is told in the Hebrew Bible, there are several Egyptian papyri that establish, to greater or lesser degrees, the verisimilitude of the background of the Exodus story. We learned from these papyri that there were Canaanite slaves that had on occasion escaped from Egypt, and that their route out of Egypt was, in some ways, similar to that which was taken by the Israelites in the story. We also saw that shepherds would bring their flocks into Egypt to water them, and this was documented at the border. In addition to the textual evidence, there was also archaeological data that needed to be considered. Perhaps the most difficult problem for a historical reading of the Exodus story as presented in the Hebrew Bible is the number of Israelites purported to have left Egypt. We learned from several biblical sources that 600,000 fighting men were said to have exited the land, leading to an estimate of two, three, million people participating in the exodus in total. While several attempts have been made to reinterpret this figure, we saw that the text seems to understand this number as it has always been interpreted. Indeed, other aspects of the story rely on the fact that the Israelites were a massive horde that exited Egypt and were making their way through the desert to the land of Canaan. Other archaeological and historical data suggested that following the expulsion of the Hyksos in 15 70 BCE, there was tightened security at the Egyptian border for people moving both in and out. This would have made the departure of a group of Israelite slaves incredibly difficult to miss. Finally, we looked at some of the toponyms that were mentioned as part of the route that the Israelites took out of Egypt, with a focus on two cities mentioned in the biblical text, Pithom and Ramses. While the mention of several of these toponyms could reflect circumstances as they were in the 13th century BCE, they quite often also fit well, sometimes much better, in a later period, hundreds of years after the period in which the Exodus was supposed to have taken place. This led us to briefly consider some of the more common interpretations that scholars hold with respect to the evidence presented above. The more traditional position that the Exodus was a historical event that took place in the 15th century, much as it is described in the Old Testament, is held by only a small number of scholars. The majority of scholars seem to hold that there is likely at least a historical kernel that lies behind the event events, with a small percentage of these, like James Hoffmeyer, Kenneth Kitchen, arguing for the general historicity of the events as described in the book of Exodus, those that conclude that there is some historical event, S, that stand behind the story, generally think that this would have taken place in the 13th century BCE. Finally, we looked at some of the other theories that consider the Exodus to be either not historical or to have become a cultural memory that was passed on and reworked to suit the needs of those transmitting the story. With all of this in mind, what can we say about the story of the Exodus as we read it in the Old Testament? If you find yourself in a debate or discussion on this topic, what are some important conclusions that you can reasonably draw and argue for? I think that two things can be safely determined in light of the textual and archaeological evidence, and the atheist or skeptic should feel comfortable standing on these conclusions. First, the Exodus as described in the Old Testament is not historically reliable. Not only do we lack evidence for these events, but the historical situation that we know of in the late Bronze Age in Egypt and Canaan is incongruent with the events described in the text. As Prop observes, 
Archaeologists and textual historians agree that the biblical narrative is not contemporary with purported events, has a complex literary prehistory, and does not fit comfortably with known ancient Near Eastern history. In order to overcome seemingly impossible details, like two, three million people leaving Egypt at one time, significant reinterpretations are required that appear to be quite problematic. Second, the story has very similitude. The background to the narrative has many aspects that generally fit with the circumstances of the second millennium. It would be unwise to conclude that none of the concepts or themes in the Exodus narrative can be found in the world of ancient Egypt and Canaan. There were Canaanite slaves in Egypt. Egypt did enslave and control the Canaanite population in Canaan itself. There were slaves that escaped from Egypt. In fact, it is quite likely that this familiar backdrop made it easier for the story to remain in popular usage. However, and this is very important, just because some or even many of the toponyms or the general backdrop might fit well in the second millennium, we must remember two things. First, they do not all fit together in a specific moment in time. Many of these events took place spread out over a period of hundreds of years. Second, just because the story contains some genuine elements or even memories, we cannot simply conclude that the story as a whole is true. As we often say, no one would conclude that Spider-Man is a true story simply because it took place in New York City. In the end, what matters most about the story is it that a literal two, three million people were miraculously delivered from captivity following 10 supernatural plagues being inflicted upon the wicked Egyptians. No, I don't think so. What matters most, in my opinion, is how the story has been used by believers to sustain them through periods of great difficulty. Indeed, stories can be incredibly powerful. By way of analogy, William Propp has brilliantly described the development of the miraculous story of the Battle of Mons during World War I. The British soldiers, under a fighting retreat, came to believe that they had been delivered by angelic beings who fought for them against the Germans. This was not an isolated story, but became an international account of deliverance, even making its way into some sources as purported history. What are we to make of such a story, and how can it help us understand the Exodus? Prop writes, We know that the Battle of Mons occurred. We know its precise dates. We know its exact location. We know the historical context. We can date much and story to the day. We can supply oral and written testimony from literally thousands, probably tens of thousands of diverse sources to gain a stereoscopic image of the times. In other words, we have precise reference points to support historical analysis. Yet, for all of this historical information surrounding the events in question, there is universal consensus that angels did not miraculously defeat the German army at the Battle of Mons. But did that really matter at the time? In a very real sense, it did not. Rightly or wrongly, such a story not only bolstered the confidence of the soldiers who believed they had been divinely delivered out of harm's way, but also reinforced the unity of many of them around this shared experience. In the same way, the story of the miraculous deliverance of Yahweh against the evil Egyptian pharaoh may have served to bolster confidence and unify the fledgling group known as Israel, forming in the highlands of Canaan, setting them apart from the surrounding people groups. At a minimum, the Exodus ultimately served as a powerful origin story that continues to keep those who identify with it as a unified people, even thousands of years later. What's next? As our journey through the veiled corridors of history comes to a close, we hope this exploration into the Exodus has ignited a spark of curiosity and critical thought within you. MythVision is committed to bringing you documentaries that challenge perceptions and illuminate truths with the most cutting-edge scholarship available. Our odyssey through the tales of the past is far from over. We are dedicated to dissecting not just the Bible, but various mythologies across the globe, bringing the stories you thought you knew to life in ways you never imagined. 
But to continue this ambitious journey, we need you. By joining our Patreon or YouTube membership program, you become part of the MythVision family, a community of thinkers, seekers, and explorers just like you. Your support allows us to dive deeper, push further, and bring more of these compelling narratives to light. If a one-time donation suits you better, it is just as valuable in helping us continue these projects. Every contribution, big or small, fuels our quest and keeps the torch of understanding burning bright. So, as we conclude this chapter, remember to check the description below to purchase Joshua Bowen's The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament. Dive deeper into the evidence and form your own conclusions. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and join the conversation in the comments. Your engagement is the cornerstone of our community. Thank you for watching, for questioning, and for journeying with us. Together, let's continue to uncover the mysteries of our past to better understand our present and future. This is Myth Vision, where every myth has a vision. Until next time, we are Myth Vision.